A major side effect of the laissez-faire economics of the Gilded Age was what we call the concentration of wealth. It was caused specifically by the high tariff policies of the federal government to protect American businesses from foreign competition. These tariffs impacted Americans because they kept prices artificially high for many years. It was also caused by the creation of monopolies. As competition was eliminated and businesses merged, these capitalism industry gained more and more wealth. Finally, a lack of gold supply contributed to the concentration of wealth. It was caused by an increase in the population coupled with the dynamic growth of the economy during the Gilded Age. Let's look at some numbers. By 1861, the U.S. only had three millionaires. By 1900, that number was 4,000. Just for the sake of comparison, in 2000, there were only 49 billionaires in the U.S. In 2020, that number is now 540. Concentration of wealth is definitely alive and well in the 21st century. Let's compare it to the world, where in 2000 there were 322 billionaires. In 2020, that number has ballooned to 2095. What does this mean for the Gilded Age? In the 1890s, over 80% of Americans lived in poverty, because only 10% of the population controlled over 90% of the wealth. Remember that a robber baron is a person who has become rich through ruthless and unscrupulous business practices. The term was first used to describe Vanderbilt as he undercut his competitors to wipe out railroad competition. As you can see in the chart, John D. Rockefeller is the richest man of all time, with an estimated 2020 net worth of over $340 billion, followed by Andrew Carnegie at $310 billion. The richest man in the world today is Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, with a net worth of about $193 billion just ahead of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, who is worth an estimated $185 billion in today's money. In fifth place is Microsoft founder Bill Gates at $118 billion, who by the way has given over $30 billion in donations to various causes. Number six is Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, who has also donated money to different causes, including the Connect program we use here at Memorial. Last on our list is JP Morgan at the tiny amount of $49 billion. As you can see, the robber barons of the Gilded Age compiled more money than the top businessmen of 2020. The Johnstown Flood of 1889 happened after the failure of the South Fork Dam, located on the Little Comanaw River upstream of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. The dam broke after several days of heavy rainfall. The dam was built between 1838 and 1853 as a part of a canal system. Henry Clay Frick purchased a nearby abandoned reservoir and turned it into a private resort for his wealthy friends, mostly connected to Carnegie Steel. The dam was lowered to allow for a road to be built on top of it, which increased the vulnerability of the dam. The relief pipes and valves put in place to help lower the water in, a, in an emergency were removed and sold. Frick and the members built the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, and membership grew to more than 50 wealthy Pittsburgh steel, coal, and railroad industrialists. On May 28th, after between 6 and 10 inches of rain in a 24-hour period, the dam breached, containing over 3.8 billion gallons of water. South Fork was hit first, destroying 20 to 30 houses and killing four people. As the water moved down towards Johnstown, trees, houses, and animals were swept into the water. About an hour after the dam collapsed, the flood hit Johnstown. The water was traveling at 40 miles per hour and at a height of 60 feet in some places. Many people were crushed by debris, caught in barbed wire from the wire factory upstream, or down, drowned. Those who made it to their roof waited hours for help to arrive. Eighty people died in a fire at the Stone Bridge when debris piled up from upstream. It took workers three months to remove the mass of debris from the flood. The total death toll was around 2,200. Ninety-nine families died, including 396 children. 124 women and 198 men were widowed and 98 children were orphaned. 777 people were never identified. Some people blame the members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club for failure to maintain the dam properly. Several members of the club contributed to the relief efforts, donating thousands of dollars. Andrew Carnegie built the town a new library. As I mentioned earlier, about 80% of workers in the U.S. live below the poverty line. But that doesn't mean they weren't working. The 1890 census tells us that it cost about $530 a year for a family of four to meet their minimum living standards for food, housing, and other necessities. Unfortunately, the average yearly income for worker families was $380 per year. That means most Americans were living in impoverished conditions. 
Working conditions during the Gilded Age were horrible. The average workday was 10 hours, and you worked six days a week, with Sundays off for church. The work was routine, boring, and often very dangerous. If you were injured on the job, there were no worker protections, such as insurance or health care. If you were injured and could not work, you were fired and replaced. Large numbers of children and women in the workforce, largely for lower pay, since they were considered secondary wage earners. Gilded Age workers were hurt by the boom-bust economy. During hard times, factories laid off workers and lowered wages. During prosperous times, the workers did not get to reap the benefits, with all the profits going to the business owners and management. Many of the factory workers were immigrants, performing unskilled labor at lower wages. Native-born Americans resented these immigrants and began pushing for immigration restrictions. This contributed to a feeling of nativism around the country by white Americans. Business owners were hesitant to raise wages during the Gilded Age. High wages hurt corporate profits, which they believed prevented them from opening new factories and growing their company. Second, if they kept wages low, they could hire more workers and increase profitability. Third, factory owners believed that the workers would spend any additional wages on gambling, alcohol, and other vices. Low wages actually protected their workers and families from sin. Most Americans opposed the labor movement since it was presented in the media as violent troublemakers and anarchists, and they demonstrated in incidents like the Haymarket riot. Employers knew the federal government would help them defeat strikes. The Industrial Revolution saw the rise of factories in need of workers. Children were ideal employees because they could be paid less, were often a smaller stature, so could attend more minute tasks, and were less likely to organize and strike against their horrible working conditions. Immigration to the U.S. led to a new source of labor and child labor. In the 1880s, groups from Southern and Eastern Europe arrived, providing a new pool of child workers. Educational reformers of the mid-19th century attempted to convince a public that a primary school education was a necessity if the nation was to advance. Several states established a minimum wage for labor and requirements for school attendance, though many of these laws were full of loopholes that were readily exploited by employers hungry for cheap labor. Labor responded to poor working conditions by uniting into unions and conducting strikes. The late 19th century witnessed the most violent labor conflicts in the nation's history. So common were the reports of striking workers battling police or state militia that many feared that the country was heading towards open class warfare between capital and labor. Labor started to create national unions in order to combat the influence of big business. The first national union was the Knights of Labor. They were led by Terence Powderly. They promoted the social and cultural improvement of the working man. As a labor union, it negotiated with employers for better conditions. They fought for and won the implementation of an eight-hour day for government employees. Once the Panic of 1893 hit, the Knights of Labor lost most of its importance and ability to negotiate. The second major national labor union was the American Federation of Labor, founded in 1886 by an alliance of craft unions. Its leader was Samuel Gompers. Still around today, the AFL used strikes to try and improve the working conditions of workers across the country. As labor unions began to go on strike to fight for better conditions, they turned violent. Union members of the railroad industry went on strike in the Great Strike of 1877. They went on strike for more than a week was broken up when several state governors asked President Hayes to intervene. He sent in federal troops to end the strike. The Haymarket Affair occurred after six strikers had been killed at the McCormick Harvester plant. They were meeting in the Chicago Square to protest police brutality. The rally was dispersing when the police finally showed up. Someone tossed a bomb into the police line, killing seven police officers and several workers. No one knows who threw the bomb, but two speakers and four radicals from the demonstration were tried and found guilty. Four were hanged and one committed suicide. The Homestead strike occurred at the Carnegie Steel Plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Management hired armed guards from the Pinkerton Detective Agency to protect the plant so they could hire scabs to work at the plant. A fierce battle followed with three Pinkertons and nine workers dying. It would take the Pennsylvania National Guard to end the strike the union gave in. The Pullman strike was a big blow to unions. To break it up, President Cleveland sent in federal troops. Eugene Debs was imprisoned, and Pullman pulled 
fired most of its workers, and the other railroads blacklisted many others so they couldn't get As you can see in the graph, the U.S. economy experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows during the years following the Civil War. The business cycle, as it's called, experienced depressions like the one following the Civil War, the Panic of 1873, and the Panic of 1893. The Klondike Gold Rush of 1896 contributed to the economic recovery after the Panic of 1893. Overall, big business had a massive impact on American society, government, and the economy during the Gilded Age. In terms of social effects, big business made life better for many Americans by lowering consumer prices and raising their standard of living. Research became much more important as the corporate world and the academic world worked together to make better products. Unfortunately, working and living conditions were very poor and won't improve until the reform movement of the progressive era, forcing the government to step in. Philosophy becomes very important during this period as many academics begin writing theories to justify the exorbitant wealth of the robber barons. In terms of the government, the pursuit of monopolies and elimination of competition threatened democracy, as a few people controlled most of the wealth and the resources of the nation. This, of course, led the government this, of course, led to government and corporate corruption as big business tried to keep their power. Obviously, big business had a large effect on the U.S. economy during the Gilded Age. The corporate structure was created, which brought order, stability, and standardization to industry. As business grew, so did the number of jobs available. Large pools of wealth developed new technology, new inventions, and new forms of business. All of this produced huge swings in the economy, which we call the boom-bust cycle. 